Well, good morning. Great to see each of you guys here today. What a beautiful day God has given us today. Isn't it beautiful outside? And what a blessing. It's so good to see each of you here with us. It's also great to see all the kids in the classrooms. It just really brings joy to my heart and soul to see, to see kids here learning about Jesus and the Bible. Uh, thank you, uh, parents, for, for bringing them, and thank you for being here yourself. Thank you for those of you that are uh, watching online. We are uh, concluding our series today um, called Tomorrowland, and I just want to throw up the, the slide of the, the Bible, the books of the Bible. As you know, there's 66 books of the Bible divided into Old Testament and New Testament, and they're divided into categories, and so there's what's called the law, which is the first five books, and then there's history, 12 books of the history. There's minor prophets, major prophets, poetry, gospels, and we're in what's called right now the epistles or the letters. There's Paul's epistles or general epistles, and so we're in Paul's epistle or letter to the Thessalonians, and Paul writes about what's called eschatology or end times doctrines, and that's what we're looking at in this series on Tomorrowland. So next week, though, we'll actually be in the Old Testament major prophet Ezekiel. And so if you want to read ahead, Ezekiel 1 and 2, uh, Ezekiel uh, sees a vision of the glory of God. And so there's some interesting things you can read and look at next week, uh, Ezekiel 1 and 2. But today we're talking about the Antichrist. How many of y'all have heard of the term Antichrist? Have y'all heard that term before? Okay, good. Uh, that term is in the Bible. It's actually John's description of an individual that's in, in the end times called the Antichrist. Paul calls him the uh, lawless one or son of perdition, if you have an older King James. Um, Revelation 13 calls him the beast. Pretty strong terminology, the beast, the Antichrist. That's what we'll be looking at today. So we're in uh, 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, if you have a Bible, or today when you came in, you should have a program, and in that program is going to be an outline. We'll also put the verses on the, the screen beside me here today. So in, in, in thinking about this and getting ready for this topic, this is kind of a heavy topic. It's uh, Paul's writings are to bring encouragement. He doesn't want to stress out, which we'll read about, but I, I can't help but just be a little bit, um, I don't know, this is kind of heavy material. How many of you, I'll just ask you this, how many of you have ever been lied to or deceived? And how does that feel to be lied to and to be deceived? I mean, you think this, but then really behind the scenes there's something else going on. You're told this, but then actually it just turns out to be just completely bogus. And this is what we're talking about today, this rise of lies, deception, and that's what is at the heart of the Antichrist is deception and lies, and, and, and it's all around us. And, and we continue to have to, to deal with the fallout of deception and lies. How many of y'all saw there was, um, back in 2011, there was a guy by the name of Harold Camping that spent over $100 million dollars on billboards, and there was over 5,000 billboards in all the major cities saying, Judgment Day, May 21st, 2011. Did you ever see one of those billboards or see the pictures of those billboards? I mean, it really got a lot of people's attention. And so Harold Camping had a pretty big ministry called Radio, a family radio, and he was big into trying to pick the date. And so he picked May 21st, 2011. Well, when that day didn't come, then he said, oops. And then he chose October 2011. And uh, he was wrong again. And so the thing that's so sad about Harold Camping is that we should have known, people should have known that, you, you, first of all, you can't pick a date, right? Matthew 24, 36, it says, no one knows the day or the hour, no one. So anyone that starts picking that day, we can say, well, that's probably the day he's not going to come <laughs> because no one knows. Jesus said this. And Jesus repeated this 
Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke chapter 21. In the Olivet Discourse, and Jesus teaching about this stuff, this end time stuff, he says no one knows. So that's one of the first signs that we need to be aware of when people pick days. And also, when we're talking about Antichrist, you can't name the person either because the Bible doesn't name the person. So anyway, just be aware of people to start naming people as possibly the Antichrist. But with, with Harold Camping, some other things, he wrote a book called 1994 where he actually predicted the end of the world in 1994. So now you have this person that has gotten three of these dates wrong, and the Bible would call this person a false teacher or a false prophet. And what was sad about him, too, was that he did some other things that were kind of concerning. Uh, he would be so headstrong about this is the day that it's going to be. He would encourage people to give. And people gave life savings towards this individual. And so people would contact him and say, I gave him my whole life savings and your day wasn't right. And he didn't really care. He had millions of dollars, but he didn't care the fact that someone gave their life savings and he was wrong and he wouldn't admit that he was wrong. So that's another red flag of, of a very uh, disturbed individual that takes from people and then doesn't care that, that they're penniless. Uh, something else that he did too was that ministry had an opportunity to spread Bibles in China. And instead of just getting the word out in China and giving the Bibles away, he says, no, we'll only, our ministry will only do it if we'll give away my book with the Bible. And so someone said, well, you think your book is just as important as the Bible? What do you think he said? Yeah, he thought that his book on this phony end times date was just as important as the Bible. So that ought to give you another indication or a red flag of somebody that's not above board. So again, my heart is just sad when I see deception, uh, especially in spiritual things. Uh, I watched the show recently, Waco, you know, David Koresh. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but just, it's just sad, you know, when, when, when people are deceived. Uh, Jim Jones, that whole thing, uh, Marshall Applewhite and the people that committed suicide. Uh, so there's just a lot of teachings that are false. There's just a lot of things. And so the Bible tells us to be aware of this. And so today's message just kind of gets us in that mindset that there's, that there's false teachings, that there are things that people say that are, that are not true. And that's why Paul writes this, by the way. Paul writes this to say, okay, guys, listen. Someone actually had sent a letter falsely saying the wrong thing. So even, this is written in 51, 52 AD. So just think about this. Jesus hasn't even been resurrected and, and, and you know, ascended into heaven less than 20 years, and you're still right now, early, early, early in the church, you have deception and false teaching going on. And so it's been going on ever since. And so Paul is writing this to help them understand what is the truth about these end-time events. So let me just quickly review where we've been, because back here on the, on the door here, we just have some terms that I want you to be aware of if you're not aware of them. We have the, just the overarching term, which is called the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so that's just a broad overarching term talking about the end. So the second coming of Christ, Paul starts out in 1 Thessalonians 4 talking about the rapture. And so the rapture, he writes to the believers, he says, guys, I don't want you to be ignorant or misinformed about those who have fallen asleep, meaning those that have died, because when Christ comes back, he will bring with those who have already fallen asleep in Christ, and the dead in Christ will be raised. Those of us who are still alive will be caught up in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. So he's talking about the snatching or the gathering away. We'll be with the Lord forever. So he says, comfort one another, encourage one another with these things. And so this whole idea that the church gets taken away and, and goes to heaven. This is also taught in John chapter 14, where Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me and my father's house are many rooms or mansions. And I go to prepare a place and I'm going to come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. So again, it's encouraging, realizing that Christ is coming. He's taking his church away. And this creates what you could say like a domino effect. So the first domino of the rapture falls, and then you have what's called a tribulation period that, that's about seven and a half years, according to the book of Revelation. During this tribulation period, uh, an antichrist rises up. We'll talk about that today. 
And then it all culminates with what's called the day of the Lord. So this is a day where Christ comes back in power and glory. Last week we looked at the fact with blazing fire with his angels. He, this is about judgment. This is about um, Christ coming in, in power and judgment. So that's the day of the Lord. And Paul uses some very strong language. Let's look at that again. First Thessalonians chapter 5. So Paul says, Now concerning the times and the seasons, I don't have to write to you about this, for you yourselves know that the day of the Lord is like a thief in the night. And so he, notice he uses the word you, you, and you. Now notice he says, uh, For when that day comes, they will say peace and safety. So notice the you and then the they. And, 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 and destruction will come upon them suddenly, and they shall not escape. So Paul wants for his believers to understand that you or we are taken away. They are who are experiencing the day of the Lord. So Paul is, is, is teaching us these truths about end times. And now today, we're going to look at the Antichrist. Let me go ahead and pray before we, we, we dive into this. Father, thank you for this time together. Lord, thank you for each person that is here today. Lord, I thank you for your love for each person. Lord, I thank you for the work that you're doing in our hearts, in our lives, in our minds. Lord, we're grateful to have your word. We're grateful for Jesus and the salvation that he offers us. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us, show us your truth, and I thank you for what you're doing in our hearts, in our lives, and in this world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's dive in. 2 Thessalonians 2. Verses 1 through 12. You get a feel of why Paul is writing this. And so he says in verse 1 of chapter 2, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. So this word gathered is another reference to the rapture, that his people, the church, is gathered to him. So concerning the coming of our Lord and our gathering to him, we ask you, brothers, this is so important. I love this. He says, to not become easily, you'll help me out, what does it say? Easily what? Unsettled. Unsettled or alarmed. Now, how many times have you, have you or you seen people that get, we get unsettled and we get alarmed? Have you experienced that? Panic, freaking out, ah, ah, ah. And, 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 and Paul's saying, no, no, don't do that. In John chapter 14, when Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled, that Greek word is an imperative. In other words, it's a command. In other words, Christ is not going to command us to do something that we're not able to do. So he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. I am commanding you. You can do this. So don't be stressed out, anxious, worried. So again, from Paul, we get the same message. Chill. Have hope. <laughs> Take a deep breath. God's in control. God's got this. Don't be alarmed. Now, what are they, what, what's there to be alarmed about? Well, let's look at what there is to be alarmed about. Unsettling. Don't be alarmed by some prophecy, some false teaching, some report, some billboard, <laughs> some book or letter. This is what's so sad, too. Someone wrote a letter to the Thessalonian church and signed Paul's name to it. Can you imagine? How, how upset would you be if someone forged a letter in your name saying a bunch of stuff that wasn't true? How many of you that would, like, really make you mad? Like, oh, Lord, if I could just get my hands on that person. So this is what Paul's dealing with. He's dealing with a church that's alarmed and, and upset because some idiot was lying to them. And said, oh, you missed the coming of the Lord. You're, you're in the tribulation. You're, you're, the day of the Lord is coming and you're in this time right now. What? So that's, that's the setting of what he's writing to. He says, don't be alarmed or unsettled by some prophecy report uh, supposed to coming from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way for that day will not come. Y'all help me out. What does it say? Until, until. So Paul is, is making a major statement. He says, 
the day of the Lord, Jesus coming in judgment, the tribulation, all this stuff is not going to happen until here's that one domino that has to fall. The Antichrist has to come up, be revealed, do his thing before Christ comes back in power and glory and honor. That's not happening until this domino, this event, this person is revealed. Y'all see that? This is what Paul is trying to say. You're not in tribulation. You're not, the day of the Lord hasn't come because you first have to have this Antichrist. So, so Paul is acknowledging the fact that the church is going to be gone but he's just teaching them about these truths that are also found in Daniel 7, 8, and 9, Revelation chapter 13, and uh, John's writings. So let, let's keep looking here. He says, uh, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs. Let's just talk about that for a moment. How many of y'all have noticed a major rebellion against God? Have y'all noticed that? Even in our own country where we say in God we trust and we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created, endowed by their creator with these rights, unalienable rights that come from our creator. And so we have this, I don't know, a foundation, I guess, if you would call it, of, of, of a belief in, in God and, and, and one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. And so you have that, and yet... Enter in Madeline Murray O'Hare or ACLU or whatever you want to call it, and we're throwing out prayer and we're taking down nativity scenes from courthouses and we're trying to just take God out of any kind of a government, public, any kind of things like that. And, and, uh, and, and, and it affects us, doesn't it? The more we move away from God, the more we rebel, the more we openly say no and disobey God, it just, it just leads us to tougher and tougher times. Paul warns us in 2 Timothy, I want to read this to you, uh, 2 Timothy 3, he talks about the last days. And just in case you, you need to be clear, the last days refer to anything from the ascension of Christ, the Pentecost, the beginning of the church, until he comes back again. And so the period of time between the church age or the Pentecost, the, the ascension of Christ and the beginning of the church, to when he comes back again is considered last days. And so we're living in the last days. And so as you're in the last days, there's like the last of the last days. And so Paul is kind of saying, this is what kind of the, the last of the last days are going to be like. He says, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Have you seen some of that in our society today? This open rebellion and this celebration of evil, wrongdoing, Paul warns us that this is how it's going to be in the last times. He also goes on to say in chapter 3 that we must be grounded to the scriptures. And so he says, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and teaching and for instruction in righteousness that the man or woman of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work because of the scriptures. And yet then he goes on in chapter 4 saying that in the last days, people will not endure sound doctrine. They will not want to hear the teaching of the word of God. But according to their own desires, because they have itchy ears, they will bring to themselves teachers who will teach them what their ears want to hear. Not the truth, but falsehoods. Have you seen some of that? <laughs> so that's uh, 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 through 5. So you have rebellion against God, against his word, and even false teaching. So he says, 
that the day will not come until the rebellion occurs, until the man of lawlessness is revealed. And so this rebellion continues and it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Uh, as we in, read the last of this chapter, um, the man of lawlessness is revealed, a man doomed to what? Destruction. Will the Antichrist be victorious? No. That's what's great about the Bible. We know how the Bible ends. Antichrist is defeated. He's going to have his heyday. He's going to do some things, but he is doomed for destruction. So number one, the first point in this passage of Scripture, why Paul writes it, he writes it so that they know that this person is coming. But the, the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist is a man of lawlessness. That's point number one. The Antichrist is a man of lawlessness. In other words, he embodies all these things we just talked about. He doesn't care about the law. He doesn't care about what's good, what's right. None of that matters to him. He is a, completely apart from anything good or moral, helpful, truthful. So he's a person that's embodied unholiness, lies, deception. That's who he is. Number two, the Antichrist. This is also pretty sinister. Not only is he bad and deceptive, but he seeks to be worshipped. Number two, look what Paul says. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So this whole idea of setting himself up in the temple, this is what's called the abomination of desolation. You'll see this also in Matthew chapter 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13. Jesus talks about this in talking about the end times. A person will come and he will uh, cause abomination to the temple and he'll set himself up, proclaiming himself to be God. So this just shows us the type of person that, that the Antichrist is and who controls him. Isaiah chapter 14, I've read this to you before, but Isaiah chapter 14 talks about the fall of Satan. And as you may know, Satan is a created being. He's, a, he's an angel, and he was a pretty high up angel. He was a, um, he's called Lucifer is another term for him. And he was on the mountain of God in the holy mountain. Let me try to, I'm sorry, I should have labeled Isaiah 14, but I didn't, I didn't uh, mark it, but let me just get to it real fast. Isaiah chapter 14, here it is. It says, the fall of Lucifer. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you've been cut down to the ground. You who weakened the nations. For you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above God's. I will sit on the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So you have the heart of Lucifer, the heart of Satan, the devil, proclaiming himself to be equal with God. So this is the desire of Satan is to receive worship. And so the Antichrist, some people actually believe that the Antichrist indwell, I mean, that Satan indwells the Antichrist, that he's possessed. He will oppose and exalt himself above everything that is called God or his worship so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. So again, these teachings are found in Daniel Chapter 7 through 9, talking about this man of evil setting himself up. And so Paul had, had talked about this before. Verse 8. And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. Verse 7. For the secret power of lawlessness, and I underline this, is already at work. The power of lawlessness is already working. How many of you have seen evil at work in our society? Have you all seen this? You've seen the battle between good and evil. There's a battle going on right now between good and evil. As it says in Ephesians chapter 6, a lot of us love this, for our battle is not against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities and evil rulers and spiritual forces. So we're told that there's this battle going on between good and evil. Now who wins? Jesus wins. Good 
wins. And so it's not a teaching about dualism where God's getting his t- tail kicked and then you know God wins some and Satan wins some. No, God ultimately wins. But on the earth, he allows this tension. And, and, you, and it starts in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, uh, the whole chapter is called The Fall. It's a major teaching in the Bible. Uh, God creates the heavens and the earth. He says, it is good, it is good, it is good. And, and he puts man in the garden, and uh, there, there's perfection. And, and uh, he, he creates an even better creation called a woman, okay? Man 2.0, improved version. <laughs> And he, he, he puts them there and he says, all right, there's this one tree over there. Now, don't you eat from that tree over there, that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can have all the trees, but don't go to that one. And so they're going along and then not too long after they're there, there's this serpent that shows up, right? And it says the serpent was cunning and, and he was, you know, wiser than all the other animals. And the serpent begins saying things like, hey... Did God really say that? So this serpent begins to question God, question the motives of God. Oh, God doesn't want you to have the best. Oh, God is holding back from you. You know, when you eat of this fruit, you're going to be like God. And, and so this serpent is selling them a bill of goods, getting them to disobey God. And it worked. His lies, their temptation... They fell for it. So they ate of the tree. God calls them together for a powwow and says, oh boy, what have you done? Adam, like a man, he blames his wife. (laughs) Take it like a man and blame your wife. (laughs) God wasn't having any of that. Everybody was responsible, so he's, he's having his little talk with, with Adam, and he's having his talk with, with Eve, and, and what I want to want to kind of tune into is, is his talk with, with the serpent, and this is what you call the, the proto-evangelion. I don't know why theologians have to come up with these Latin terms. I guess when you're in seminary and you got a test, that's one of your terms, you know. What's the proto-evangelium? It's the, it's just, what it means is the first gospel. So hear the first gospel. So God is talking to the serpent. He says, I'm going to put enmity division, fighting between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Between, this could also be translated your offspring and, and her offspring. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. So this is talking about the struggle that's going on, but ultimately Christ will stomp the head of the serpent and crush his head. So it's ultimate victory, but the devil pierces the heel or crucifies the son. Now, what's interesting to me is this this whole idea of the devil's seed or the devil's offspring. Now, does the devil have literal kids? It's not saying that. But what this is saying is that those who follow the devil are like his kids. They're like his offspring. And so let me just take us into the New Testament real fast because Jesus spoke this way. John 8, 58. He's having this discussion with the religious leaders. And he says, you guys, Pharisees, you're brood of vipers. So he's calling them the serpent, basically. He says, you follow your father, the devil who was a liar from the beginning, and he's the father of lies, and all that he speaks is lies. You guys follow your father, the devil. Wow, can you imagine a hard cut down that would be for Jesus to say, you're just like your father, the devil. Man, but he's calling them out saying, your behavior, your mindset, all that you're doing, you're following him. Peter (laughs) <laughs> One time when Jesus is saying, all right, the Son of Man, he's going to be betrayed, turned over, crucified, but I'll rise again. Remember what Peter says? Peter says, oh, oh that can't happen to you. Oh, no, Jesus. No, you, you can't do that. What did Jesus say to Peter? He says, get behind me what? Get behind me Satan. So in other words, Peter was fulfilling and saying things that were anti-God, anti the, what Christ was about to do, Peter was, was using the very words that the, the, the devil would be. You don't have to die on the cross. Worship me. 
I'll give you all the kingdoms. So Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are saying the things of Satan. You are not following the things of God. So Peter had a choice to make, didn't he? Man, do I want to keep following Satan <clears throat> like Judas eventually did? Or do I want to follow Christ? So I think we're all for, I mean, we're all, we all have those, th those choices to make, good or evil, right or wrong, truth or lies, right? It's a temptation that we all struggle with. It's a battle. The black dog and the, and the white dog, and, and they're fighting all the time. The angel or the demon on your shoulder. We see it in cartoons. That's, that's our reality. And so what, what Paul is, is saying is that this power of lawlessness is already at work. There, there's the devil's work that's been going on, and, and, and it rears his ugly head in, in, in major ways sometimes, like in Egypt, when Pharaoh said, all right, we're going to kill every Jewish baby that's born. When they're born, throw them into the Nile River. That's like a spirit of the Antichrist. Whenever you read in the book of Esther, this guy by the name of Haman says, all right, we're going to kill all of God's people. That's like the spirit of the Antichrist. Anytime you have people that are attacking the word of God or the people of God, it's like the spirit of the Antichrist. <clears throat> Some people thought that Adolf Hitler was possibly the Antichrist. Why would they think that? The very things that we're just mentioning. He was involved in the occult and his mom was involved in witchcraft and he had like a sorcerer kind of a advisor, and, and, and he, he spoke out blasphemies against the Jews and God's people, and, and he killed over six million of them. So you have this person that's just seeking to do evil, and this is the embodiment of the Antichrist. And so you have this <clears throat> secret power of lawlessness that's already at work, but it's going to be <clears throat> a lot worse. Imagine someone as bad as Adolf Hitler. And that's what this is alluding to. So verse 6 and 7, these are, these are controversial passages, and I just want to help us to unpack them and understand them a little bit. So he goes on to say that, now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. So in other words, Antichrist is going to step forward, but something's holding him back. Verse 7, what is that? For the secret power of lawlessness has already worked. In other words, he's already at work. But notice this. The one who holds him back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. So what is holding back the Antichrist? Five different explanations, because it's not really clear. One, one explanation is, well, maybe that's the Roman Empire holding back, but that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because the Roman Empire is in the past, and Paul is speaking of future events. Uh, some people think that it's human government holding it back, but that doesn't make sense because there's still human government. You read in Revelation during the, the tribulation, and human government doesn't really hold back much of anything anyway. Uh, some people think that it could be a Satan. Like, well, that doesn't make sense. A kingdom divided against itself can't stand, so why would Satan hold back Satan? And then another explanation is maybe it's the church, because Jesus says the gates of hell will not prevail. And, but you, you realize that when you get to verse 7, it says the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until, what does it say? He, singular. So when you think of the one and he, singular, most commentators, and I've read about 12, most commentators believe that this is talking about the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is holding back the Antichrist. And so when the church is taken out, then you don't have... The, all the prayers, right? How many of y'all believe in the power of prayer? Y'all believe in the power of prayer? When you pray, God moves and he answers our prayer and lives are changed and marriages are turned around and people are, are healed and, and God does wonderful and powerful things when his people pray. So when the church is taken out, then it, then it, uh, it means that the restrainer, is taken out. But you got to be careful with this. You can't take this too, too far because, and, and Nikki actually brought this up because you can't say, well, the Holy Spirit's gone because 
you can obviously see that the Holy Spirit is still at work even during the tribulation. And here's why. In Revelation chapter 7, it talks about this group called the 144,000. The 144,000. And it says that the 144,000, that they are sealed. And this word sealed is a description of what the Holy Spirit does. It says in Ephesians and in Corinthians that we've been sealed until the day of redemption. Now, I know that word seal is just kind of a weird, we don't, we don't understand what sealed is necessarily because back then they would have like these letters, they'd write a letter and they'd take a glob of wax and stick it on the edges of the paper and they would take this imprint and they would mark it and they would make a seal meaning they could only be opened by the person that it was addressed to. And so when it says that believers have been sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, that only God, you know, can can affect that. So the, 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 the idea of being sealed is what the Holy Spirit does. It's part of his ministry. He convicts of sin. He's a counselor. He, he guides us in all truth. And he seals us until the day of redemption. So Paul says, do not, was it offend the Holy Spirit for which you are sealed until the day of redemption? Redemption, grieve, that's the word, grieve, do not grieve, thank you. Grieve the Holy Spirit. So you see this idea of the 144,000 being sealed, and because of their testimony, they are witnessing, and there's what you call saints, that you read about these saints in, in Revelation, saints. And so saints are people who are believing in Jesus Christ. Also, you read about these two witnesses, and it says these witnesses are empowered by God to speak the truth, proclaim the gospel, and they can do some other uh, pretty cool stuff. And so if you want to read about the witnesses, they are, so you got the 144,000 in chapter 7 of Revelation. The witnesses are going to be in chapter 11 of Revelation. And so these witnesses are also proclaiming the message about Christ. And so because you have people that are believing, and then because of their belief, they get persecuted, they get martyred. And so you read about martyrdom and people, how many of y'all have heard about people losing their head or being beheaded during the tribulation. So that's what's going on. So what's amazing is, is that even though God has taken out the church, there is still the work of God going on during the tribulation through the 144,000, through the two witnesses. And so you have this work of God and, and the Holy Spirit is involved as well. So he's restrained, not completely removed. Yeah. Do y'all see that? Okay, I know, this is like, whew, this is some heavy stuff. So the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way. Verse 8, then the lawless one will be revealed. He pops up, he stands out, he takes power, and it talks about the fact that he creates this peace treaty with the world, and he makes everything seem like it's a peaceful time, and he's going to protect Israel, but then what he really does is he sets up himself to be worshipped. And then he also, he, he, he causes or forces people to take a mark on their head or on their hand, and you can't buy or sell or do anything unless you receive the mark, which means that you're worshipping the beast. So the mark has to do with worship. And so this is what the Antichrist does. He forms this one world government, and he is the leader of everything, and he desires to be worshipped, and he sets up what he does in opposition to God. And so it says that he'll be revealed whom the Lord Jesus Christ will... What's Jesus going to do this, to this guy? He will overthrow him with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. So again, when Christ comes back in all power and all glory, he completely destroys all enemies, including the Antichrist and all the armies that he has amassed against Christ. You can read about this in, in uh, Revelation chapter 19. He comes on a white horse with all the saints with him, power, glory, a sword out of his mouth, destroying his enemies. So again, Paul just reminds us that Antichrist raises up, but Christ crushes him. Number three, so number one, he's a man of lawlessness. Number two, he seeks to be worshipped. Number three, what he does is all about deception. And this is where we're going to close today. 
what he does is all about deception. He is trying to deceive people. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of who? Satan. So Satan is at work in this man. He's displaying all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. Now, how many of you know that the devil can do counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders? Right? This is what Jesus taught us as well. Be aware of false teachers that can do all kinds of signs and wonders. Be aware of this. This is what he will do. And he, he does this so that he is, deceives those who are what? Perishing. Those who are perishing, he deceives them. When you read in Revelation chapter 13, you read about, he's called the beast, and the beast, let me find it real fast. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell upon the earth by these signs which he's granted to do. So he does miracles, signs, wonders of every kind of evil. He deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love. What? What does it say? They refuse to love the the truth. And so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that they will be condemned. And, and they have not believed, there it is again, the truth and have delighted in wickedness. And so this is so important that we understand that even during this great tribulation period, you have the testimony of the 144,000 witnesses. You have the testimony of the two witnesses. They're proclaiming God, be saved, follow Jesus Christ. And so you have this testimony of truth. But then you also have this person that says, no, 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 I'm the truth. They're lying. And, and he performs signs and wonders and he deceives those that are perishing. And so even in the tribulation period, you have a choice. Could I follow the truth or do I follow? Follow the deceiver and the liar. And, and some people are deceived and they follow this individual instead of what God's truth is. And you know, it's not, it's not too much different than this today, is there? Today, we all have a choice. Will we follow the truth or we follow a lie? Will we follow the light or will we walk in the darkness? See, because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is the truth. He says, follow me and you will not walk in darkness. And so even in, when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt, through Joshua, God says, I have set before you life and death. Now choose life that you and your kids may live. Choose life. Choose truth. Choose Christ. <laughs> Because there are alternatives. So I want to ask you today, what have you chosen? Have you chosen the truth? Christ is the truth. The word of God is the truth. And there's a lot of falsehoods and a lot of deception out there. I have chosen to put my life and to follow Jesus Christ. And I hope that you will as well. Christ is truth. Christ is life. He's the one who delivers us from judgment of our sins. He's the one that delivers us from hell. He delivers us. He saves us. He redeems us. That's the truth. The lie is, oh, you can do it yourself. Oh, follow this, follow that. A hundred million lies, one truth. Which will you follow? I hope that you'll follow Jesus Christ and his word. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, I pray as was already mentioned that we would not be dismayed, uh, panicked, alarmed, freaked out by all the deception and lies that there are in the world. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be people of truth. Lord, may we know the truth and may the truth set us free. May we follow the truth. Lord, we know that you are the truth. You are the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through you. We know that your word is true. Lord, I pray that we build our lives upon your word, that we build upon a solid foundation, 
when waves of deception, trouble, problems come, when liars, deceivers, false teachers come, Lord, may we stand firmly upon your truth. And so empower your people to be people of truth, to walk in the truth. I pray for anyone here today that has not received the truth of Jesus Christ, that today they would say, yes, Jesus, come in my life. Save me. I'm a sinner. I turn from my sins and I turn to you. Lord, thank you for those that are turning to the truth. Thank you for the difference that you make. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, thank you all for being here today. Next week, we'll be in the book of Ezekiel. If you want to read ahead to Ezekiel 1 and 2, we'll be talking about how God desires for us to have a new heart. God bless you.